Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 95, A Search for a Definitive Peace. In England, there is chaos and a new regime. The royalty itself has been muted, and once again, for the second time this century, the lords are in charge. Henry III has run into the same issues as his father had. Powerful lords did not like their king to be a free spender, especially one that could not win wars. So they brought him to heel again, along with his pain-in-the-neck son, if you want to call him that. In Wales, the anxiety after the success starts to take hold. The winter of 1258 was a very different one for Llewellyn. He had fulfilled his target of taking Wales, or at least the remaining parts that could be controlled from the native perspective. He now needed the political legitimacy to keep it. To date, we have chatted about his attempts at creating international allies, one that seemed to be at best mixed. A few Scottish lords aside, progress on that front had not been very good. Internally, he had spent the next year solidifying his place, but in the end, the struggles with England left him without a majority partner in his attempt to create a kingdom within the English hegemony. While the king before being summoned and controlled at Oxford, proposed taking on Llewellyn and to defeat him, far from agreements or treaties, to try and push him back down a rung of control and to keep him knuckled under, as it were, as we mentioned in the last episode. This may have been more about grabbing land back for Edward rather than actually enforcing a royal will, But as we talked about, this whole episode left Edward isolated away from his parents and possibly ready to make his own moves, had his money and control not run out. During the upheaval at Oxford, Llewellyn had sent envoys. Inin, the abbot of Aberconwy, who we will mention again in future episodes, would obviously be one of his local clerics, and Madoc Ap Philip, who unfortunately I couldn't find much about. The hope appeared to be that Llewellyn would be able to gain a true peace with Henry, to negotiate a final and complete peace with the English, to create a principality of Wales where he was recognized as the head of that hegemony and that everyone else there would have to do him homage, and he then would do homage to the English king. Unfortunately, these hopes much like everything else, were tempered by the reality that Henry was no longer his own man. The barons, while no longer wanting war, were not prepared for a full treaty and only agreed basically to a truce. The king acknowledged the fact that Llewellyn controlled his territory, but he did not cede them completely. In fact, none of the English leadership was prepared to give Llewellyn what he craved. They bluntly felt that they could not afford a strong Welsh state on their borders and controlling land which so recently had been theirs. But they could not afford another war at this point, and with things on a knife edge, they decided that it would be wiser to play for time and delay any resolution that would work against them. Unfortunately, this would be a common theme of these negotiations over the next four years. Llewellyn, for his part, offered a fairly strong indemnity to try and pay off the English, but they weren't really interested in initially offering a smaller amount. In December, Roger Mortimer and James Audley met more of Llewellyn's envoys as the new powers in the realm. The Marcher Lords had little interest in legitimizing Llewellyn and had enough power on the Council of Fifteen Barons, who now controlled England, that they could ignore Llewellyn's desires and requests at will. This would be part of the reason that academics argue that the barons' rebellion did a little to create peace for Llewellyn. While giving him a window to finish off his domination of the native lords, it did leave him at the hands of leaders with no interest in helping him. King Henry had lost the fight and in so doing lost the Welsh War, but also ended up winning the truce. By the autumn of 1259, with three separate occasions having been attempted to try and negotiate, Llewellyn sue for peace had come at no avail. He went so far as to offer to marry the king's niece, pay 15,000 pounds to be divided amongst the king, queen, and prince Edward. These would obviously be in smaller amounts to the queen and the prince. 
as well, he would leave the king's possessions within Wales, but not nearly what he had had before Llewellyn had taken over. He did also offer some lands back to the marcher lords. In other words, this looked like an act by Llewellyn of some desperation to gain a resolution to the issue and finally end hostilities. In modern financial terms, the prince was offering nearly 20 million pounds and a fair bit of land to buy peace. This financial donation for peace would become a major sticking point for Llewellyn in later years, and some have argued could be the reasons why we end up with the Welsh finally being defeated by Edward. But the truth was that Llewellyn had tried a slightly more manageable negotiated financial payment system earlier, but Henry had decried it as a terrible deal. This would have seen Henry given £3,000, while Edward would receive much less, as would the Queen, in the range of a low couple of hundred pounds, effectively, uh, which obviously was considered to be quite unacceptable, according to the King. Henry and his lords were not really going to bend at this stage. The negotiations, which continued into 1260, did not seemingly go farther than continuing the status quo. All the while... Llewellyn just simply asked for recognition of current realities, which did not really suit those of the other side. In effect, he just wanted his own land that he had captured to be his, and that the other side would recognize the fact that he is now the Prince of Wales, and that he deserved what he would get under that situation. Uh, Henry and, of course, the barons were not really prepared to even discuss that, let alone agree to it. For their intransience, Llewellyn decided it was time to act and not sit idly by while the king and his advisors continued to play for time. It was negotiations by other means, as they would say. His first attack was at Bullith in January of 1260. This castle is in a strategically important point and had been mentioned before was built at the central point of mid-Wales, which kept watch over both north and south passages in the middle part of Wales in between hills and mountains, and because of that was seen as the significant uh, check on aggression from the north, or in some cases to some statement could be given that it was to mollify and keep pacified those in the south. But either which way, it acted as a check on them, and so this attack obviously was not welcomed. This assault apparently did the trick, as suddenly he had Henry's full attention. The king, who had been avoiding talking to him, had found reasons, basically, to make it seem like he wasn't able to meet with Llewellyn due to, oh, my son's not here, oh, the queen's not here, oh, my advisor that I need isn't around, or I'm in France, I can't talk to you right now, suddenly found an opportunity to actually have a conversation. First, the king apparently prepared a counterattack, knowing or at least fearing that Llewellyn was prepared for a wider campaign in the south. Then he tried to meet with the Welsh to avoid further conflict. In May of 1260, as the campaign season was about to really ramp up, he worked out yet another truce. This truce led to another round of negotiations between Henry, his marcher lords, and on one side, and Llewellyn on the other. This truce lasted for months before Llewellyn felt that he needed to once again move against the king. On July 17th, the English marcher lords were busy in London dealing with various situations. At that point, and in fact on that day, Llewellyn took that moment to once again take Bullith Castle, which had been returned to Roger Mortimer earlier in the year. This time, Llewellyn destroyed the castle, leaving it to Edward to repair in later years. Llewellyn, with his allies in the south, basically doing diversionary raids, but most importantly, with his victory in Bullith, must have really sunk into the English just how poor their situation was, and how easily Llewellyn had been able to move around the country and dominate the English lords. There is some suggestion that he was once again moving into Glamorgan to continue to push his control in that area further south. That, as you can imagine, would not have sat well with the king, who could not see a way to easily solve the issue, and of course would have sat horribly with his marcher lords, who had possessions in those areas. At first, the king extended the truce around July 22nd, after basically sending a testy note to Llewellyn. Then, on August 1st, called his men to take arms against Llewellyn, starting in September 8th. 
This, according to Professor Smith, who's written a very long and detailed book about the life of Llewellyn, um, showed how chaotic the leadership in England was during this period because it was manic in a way. You have them agreeing to a truce or chiding on one hand, bringing people to fight on another hand, and it will continue to be problematic from here forward. Once again, de Montfort and de Clare were put in charge to bring Cluel into account for his belligerence. Edward was now an ally of de Montfort, strangely, and likely suspected that he would be put in charge of this mess only to have it all pulled out from under him as Roger Mortimer, apparently now pardoned for answering the call of the king while his castle had been taken. Apparently, this came about later due to accusations of the castle being lodged by treachery, and that may have had something to do with it, but we're not fully sure. There may have been other reasons behind this, but of course... Some of it gets lost in the fog of various perspectives. Matthew Paris, not being a big fan of Henry, obviously would not have written positively about this whole situation. However, the English prepared for the war, with their king once again offering another truce, this time sending out the Bishop of Coventry, the Prior of Wenlock, who were then joined by Mortimer and Audley. Again, they went to the meeting place at the ford near Montgomery, to talk to Llewellyn and his advisors. This group met on August 18, 1260, and the influence of the lords on the discussion saw the truce grow in scope outside of the narrow commands of the king. However, needless to say, this is not a peace treaty. This is once again a truce in which fighting stops. And once again, these sides agreed to yet another truce. Professor Smith feels that this comes down to the chaos at court where English lords and the prince and the king all pulled for different ideas and conflicted with each other over what was the best for the realm. In this mess, Llewellyn was a flashpoint and continued disagreements on what to do with him made the whole situation get elevated even higher and made the whole problem become even higher. And in the process, Llewellyn is not able to actually even make a full peace treaty because there's no one to talk to about it. The truce of 1260 appears to have obviously done nothing to soften Henry's position. He still felt slighted by Llewellyn and seemingly having been ignored by his advisors. He complained that the monetary award of 2,000 marks was not enough to make up for the loss in Bulleth and other spots and places. Either way, one week before the royal armies were commanded to assemble, in other words, September 8th, they stood down. The English would not go to war this year. Henry had agreed to the truce. For Llewellyn, this truce gave him control of Bulleth, again, acknowledging the fact that he'd taken something without being able to get it back. The English were basically left frustrated in that respect. At least what was left of the castle, and more importantly, brought Owen ap Merduth fully into the prince's realm. Previously, Owen had been an ally, but also one of coercion because his son had been held by Llewellyn. Having finally brought Owen over, Llewellyn released his son and offered him financial rewards as well as a sign of good faith. This new territory gained allowed Llewellyn to bring pressure on Mortimer, who must have felt aggrieved at how his work was unappreciated by either side. In the end, the quest for peace came to nothing, and from 1258 to 1260, negotiations, alliances, upheavals, military victories, nothing seemed to shake the various sides of the English to finally sue for peace. The truce, which ended up lasting until August 1262, due to a f further extensions, kept everything status quo. The border would remain as it had been at the end of the fighting, and Llewellyn would be allowed to open trade between the two sides, which helped Wales and likely did not please Henry, as supplies would in part go to feed and equip the Welsh armies. It was also acknowledged that Henry, Edward, and Llewellyn were the principal lords of Wales. This kept the English and Welsh lords on a split loyalty rather than into Llewellyn's camp completely, but it did make some acknowledgement of Llewellyn's leadership on an actual treaty with England or at least a truce. In other words, Llewellyn had won at least a few concessions after his successful intervention. The ford near Montgomery Castle in Welsh is called the Hrud Chimwa, 
It became the central point for all negotiations between Henry and Llewellyn at this time period. So much so, it would be the place where the final treaty would end up taking place. This idea of holding negotiations with the Welsh and the English on the borderlands seemed to be an old one, and one that may have predated the arrival of the Normans, in fact. We don't really know for sure, but we do know that it was something that was considered normal right up until the time of Edward. That from 1261 to 1262, both sides appeared to have stood down, and each seemed happy to keep the truce, or at least pretend that they were keeping it. This changed at the end of 1262. The truce officially ended in August of 1262, and Henry was now in charge once again. In June of 1261, he was declared by the Pope to have been cleared, that he was no longer needing to keep to the tenets of the Treaty of Oxford, and, in other words, to consult with his barons. This meant, once more, he was in control of his own destiny. The barons in 1261 had tried once more to rise up, only for the whole thing to fall apart, on the back of declared joining forces with the king and de Montfort being exiled. Henry signed the Treaty of Kingston to try and agree with the barons on how disputes were resolved between the king and the nobles. But this meant, in practice, that Henry was back on his old ideas and ignoring his excesses that annoyed the barons in the first place. Henry was still plotting on how to throw off Llewellyn and his family once and for all, and to misquote his ancestor's dramatic speech, who will rid me of this turbulent prince certainly must have rang out in his halls. Llewellyn on his part, had had enough of the English. Accusations had flown for a while that neither side could be trusted to keep the truce. Worse yet, King Henry had plotted for a succession which did not include the prince or his family, should Llewellyn die. This was certainly a foreboding reality if you are expected to reach a full peace with your neighbor. In other words, bluntly, Henry didn't consider it important enough that Llewellyn was the prince, or considered himself prince. And in fact, this whole problem between the two of them is going to set the stage for much of what's to come. The fact that neither Edward nor Henry agreed to, with any actual seriousness, the descendancy of the Welsh prince to be able to pass on his leadership to his children, to do what all nobles had been able to do to that point, which is that once you had a son, that primogenita would then take on the next down. He would be the next one in charge. And if not him, then a brother or a cousin could do that. And these ideas, which had been strong in Europe at this point, especially under feudalism, had been something of a sticking point between Wales and England over all of these years. Certainly, at least during the Norman period, this has been the case, and certainly going into the Plantagenets, it's only gotten worse. The reality of it is, is that this unwillingness on the English part to allow the Welsh to have their own identity or independence certainly continues to be a problem. And, of course... One can point to all of the reasons that we pointed to before, but in this stage and at this situation, when realistically all the Welsh leadership wants to do, or at least seemingly wants to do, is get recognition of their leadership and be it under the auspices of being below the kings of England and being their liege lord is a key to the prince's arguments. And so in that respect, it, it's ironic that this never really works, that in a fact, the one thing that the Welsh were willing to give the English, in fact, is the whole reason why it all comes apart, because they cannot themselves drive them out fully. They're having to try and treat with them and, and compete on some sense that they will be on an equal footing when the English were never going to allow that or appear to not be willing to allow that. And in fact, Henry seems to enforce this whole idea. And having relationships with the king doesn't seem to matter to the English. Having strictly Norman influences in your kingdom isn't going to matter a whole lot to them as well, because keep in mind, the Scottish kings at this point are actually very much Normans as much as they are Scottish, and they themselves are not treated with the same separate dignity that, say, a, the king of France, for example, was treated. 
So in all of these cases, you see that the, to use a, a phrase which we use quite often, the Celtic kingdoms struggle at this point to try and get themselves separate recognition, separate acknowledgement, because the kings of England bluntly do not believe that they should be separate, that they should be individual kingdoms, that they should be a part of a greater English whole, one of which that, let's be honest, will include France, because, of course, they look at the French kingdoms as part of theirs as well, and that will lead to the Hundred Years' War later on in the next decade or so. And all of this will come down to, it appears that the English do not want to cede power to these native kingdoms, and they don't want to share power with them. Something which, of course, will be an issue for many centuries to come, and one could argue is still a problem today. With all that said, uh, we'll have to talk more about this next week, and certainly we'll be talking a lot more about the war that Llewellyn tries to get into in the eventual peace treaty he will sign with Henry. Uh, until next time, I, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can reach me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com, at Welsh History Pod on Twitter, or Welsh History Podcast on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. Till next time, everyone. Take care. Have a great day. Goodbye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. The Battle of Waterloo was one of the most famous turning points in world history. But what happened next? My name's David Montgomery, and I'm the host of The Siecla, a history podcast that tackles exactly that. Join me as I cover France's overlooked century in between Napoleon and World War I. The Siecle, spelled S-I-E-C-L-E, is part of the Evergreen Podcast Network and can be found wherever you get podcasts.